Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're just waiting uh, for a few more minutes before we start, uh, just to make sure everyone who wants to be here connects. OK, I think we can start. Um, first of all, thank you guys for being here. Really happy to have you. And thank you, Batul, Zain, and Rafat as well. Um, Today's talk is the second in the series of public engagement we have with uh, last year's residents um, of the uh, West 41 homebound residency. Uh, and today we've got Batul Dusuki and Zain Mahjou, uh, who have worked together on uh, an online platform, Tarif, uh, and who will kind of walk us through the process and uh, the new edition that they have online. Um, briefly, Tarif is an experimental online publishing platform, which um, actually launched in uh, 2018, aiming to start a discussion among a globally based community of contributors and readers that Batul and Zain uh, 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 kind of reach out to and have in their community um, to discuss, uh, you know, cultural, political, temporal overlaps between Arabic and English. Um, I'll let them kind of walk you through uh, the meat of it. Uh, but with Zain and Batul, we have one of the contributors to uh, the issue that we're going to look at. Rafat Majzoub is an architect, author, and artist based in Lebanon, who works uh, in the territory of reality through literature, visual arts, and public interventions. Um, he co-founded The Outpost, which is a quarterly magazine of possibilities, uh, and was its creative director for the first four issues. Uh, Rafat works on methodologies of devising fiction as a constructive and speculative historiographic tool, pushing the potential of literary authorship in the Arab world as a major stakeholder in political architecture. Um, so with that super brief introduction, I'll leave you guys to actually talk about your work and your interests. Um, we're really looking forward to it. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mace. Um, thanks for that intro. And thanks to Warehouse 421 for having us here. And thank you for everybody who's tuned in. Um, so I'm Batul. I'm going to be giving a brief intro to Tariff. Um, and then we'll take it in turns discussing the platform and talking about some of our content. Uh, so briefly, Tariff is a digital publishing platform. We conceived of it um, back in 2018, and we had started it as a kind of alternative space to the institutional and the gallery models that already exist within the region. And we wanted it to be a space of experimentation that's quite community focused and um, quite focused on um, prompting unfinished ideas, making a space for things that are not, uh, that wouldn't fit into institutions or galleries, um, kind of a space for ideas that have nowhere else to go in, in the best kind of way. Um, and so we work with uh, the community of people we know who are artists or like writers or musicians, or people who don't consider themselves to have a creative practice, but have um, an idea that they would like to implement in response to our um, cycles and issues, which are always like thematic and we give people prompts um, against which they would create something. Um, and that's kind of how we started. It was a space that we invited people, we reached out to people that we knew um, and kind of built it through our community like that. Um, from conception, Tariff was um, a digital space and Back in 2018, before COVID and before lockdown, um, we were asking questions around physical spaces and what they, how they constrain certain kinds of mediums and also how they bind people to geographies. And we had wanted this to kind of transcend the emphasis on physicality and object, the, the focus around objects within the art world and also be able to expand to a wider community that is based in many places. We do have a focus um, around like the region, the, the, the loose Swana region, people who work with it or from it or in, engage around it, but are not necessarily based in the region. And so many of us know that like, we're quite a scattered community across, across the world. And so this was part of why, being digital was really central to when we started. Um, 
Right. So with 2020 and lockdown coming into place, this became like all the more important for us and was part of why we wanted to revamp, which is what we ended up doing through the residency um, to, to make our platform uh, a lot more flexible and allow us to host uh, different kinds of words, uh, works and also allow us to create a platform that is structurally um, attuned to some of our concerns. And we'll go over, over the platform itself later. Um, so just looking through my notes here so I don't forget anything. Right, so those are, those are kind of like the main starting points that we created Tariff from, and this is what guides, guided our like decisions. Um, the word Tariff itself, I will just won't go into it brief, um, too much, but just briefly. Um, tariff and Tarif are both the title of, of, the, of the space, and they share a root. I believe Tarif is the, old, is, is the original word that then became transmuted into English. And they share a connotation based on like information-based knowledge. A tariff is literally a, a list of originally products because it was used for trade. Um, so there's that, that, there's that meaning and there's the modern meaning of using the word tarif in Arabic, which also use, uh, means to introduce or to make something known. And we really like that interplay between the two meanings of the word and that kind of informs also how we've created the space to be a inherently bilingual space where you can engage in that play of meaning between Arabic and English, which our content um, is also shaped around. So I think from, Z from there, Zayn, do you wanna take it into what we did for the residency? Yeah, and I just wanted to touch upon something very quickly. Um, when we, when Batul was talking about um, you know, our relationship with contributors from the Swana region and beyond. We also looked at language a little bit. Um, and so that kind of uh, made us want to create the platform in a bilingual format where that supports both English and Arabic and supports the, the overlap between those, those two languages, especially living and working between and I at the time when we were discussing tariff and starting to kind of uh, work on it and establish it, we're living in the UAE and working and living in the UAE, you find that English is very relevant, but so is Arabic. Um, so we kind of also wanted to explore what that means um, to the creation of work and whether you translate something or you keep it in the language or, or in its original language or have it be a mixture of both. So that kind of also feeds into how we structured um, the uh, platform itself. And um, as Batun mentioned, we had um, we had launched in 2018, we launched our first issue. And then after doing that, we kind of took a little bit of a break um, and we were launching our second issue. And our second issue um, was launched around the prompt disc. But then over time, it kind of we kind of slowed down. 2020 happened and it made everything, made all of the issues of online space more urgent. Um, and then uh, when the Warehouse 4 to 1 residency was announced, we thought it was the perfect time because these were conversations that we were already having. So it's an online residency and it allowed us to, it then allowed us to kind of take what we were discussing a little bit further and explore uh, what we wanted to. Um, so with the residency, we thought it would be a great time to um, revamp the website and look at the functionalities of the website. So the initial website that we built was on Squarespace. It was very, um, it was just catered towards the first issue and, and showcasing all of the contributions on there. And so from there, we kind of started having conversations with the developer, with us listening to the other um, residents, seeing what they were doing, and then just overall in general, what was happening with the move to Zoom, people working from home, exhibitions being online, videos being readily available. Um, and then what that means in terms of creating a space that is not just online and translating information from the physical world on it, but creating space that allows for um, content that is produced specifically for it or that gets to use the functionalities that are available to enhance it. Um, and then, so we looked at the website and we worked with a developer 
Bullet Creative, who we were introduced to by one of the other residents, Rend, uh, to launch a new website, which is now actually live. We're really excited about it. Um, and then from there, we also looked at relaunching the second issue and we changed the prompt from disc to carriers. Um, and with the um, residency, it also allowed us to also look at providing com a, commis a commissioning fee or an honorarium for the contributors to create something new in response to the cycles prompt, um, which kind of gets us to where we found Rafat and re-envisioning re the platform and um, the kind of commissioning for it. So I'll leave that with Batul to kind of speak a little bit more about. Yeah, so should we should we take a quick tour through the platform and then we'll delve into Rafat's project for like the second half of this talk. Is, it, is this, okay. Can everyone see the screen? I think so. Yeah, looks good. Um, all right, so Zane, if you can click on the menu just to show like the skeleton of navigation here. So this is basically the space where you reach all the different parts of the platform. Um, if we go to index, this was like the core um, of building the space was to be able to give people different ways of navigating the content. So we are kind of offering like these three kinds of ways of classifying the information you can view and they're non sequential and they're non um, they're like in loose alphabetical order, but uh, we haven't really put a linear time hierarchy on the content and we haven't really put like an alphabetical hierarchy on the content so we can have like a loose content based like space that you can like swim through and explore. Um, without knowing like which project belongs to which issue or anything like that. Um, so you can look through it uh, via projects, which is this page. Uh, this page. Uh, you can look through it via people, which is under contributors. Um, or you can look through it via topics. And those actually also correspond to the hashtags that we'll see later on um, each of the individual pages. So, I mean, this will grow like we just went live. Um, so if we, yeah, so this, this is one space that can take you to different places. Then maybe we can just click on one of the projects here. Yeah, let's do that. Right, so this is from our previous issue. And if we just scroll all the way to the bottom. I mean, you guys can go and explore this. Yeah, this was a in, in guide. This is, this is a guide from Jamele. It's actually quite hilarious. I highly recommend. So the, the hashtag at the bottom, if you click on that, that will take you to um, the first issue, which is called fake. And from there, you can you click on anything else that's related to, the, to fake. And so it's this like cyclical journey through the space and through um, the content, so you don't really have to go, I mean, which is something that being digital really allows us to do because um, the, the temporal capsules of each issue are not sitting in different prints on a shelf. You can, you can go between them quite, quite nicely. So that's that. Um, we also have a ledger, which is the other... Which was one thing I forgot to mention that we were also planning on doing with with during this residency, which we started working on. Yeah, so the ledger was an idea we had that we didn't get a chance to realize until the residency. And we envisioned it as a kind of um, depository of, of people in the community and people that we've worked with. And it's essentially a, it's not an Excel sheet because Excel is a brand, but it's a sheet uh, of um, people and their and their practices and some links to connect to them. And this will grow as our own network grows. And it, it currently includes um, everyone who's contributed to Tariff. It will include other people who have not contributed to Tariff or have contributed in ways that are not um, obviously visible because we have gotten, we've worked with people who didn't end up producing contribution pages per se. 
um, but there are still parts of our community so that they will also go there. And we hope for this to kind of become a community resource for visitors of the website um, to make their own connections with the people on here. So um, yeah, so th this, this will be something that grows with time. Um, right, and so this brings, up to, brings us to carriers and that's our current and latest issue. Um, I won't go too much into the content of carriers, but uh, we, briefly, we wanted to work with, um, or Sayyah Sa'ila in Arabic, we wanted to work with um, the idea of um, bodies that provide support or supported actions or supportive labor. And we invited um, several contributors, all of whom created new commissioned pieces um, to respond and interpret that theme. And so we have with us today Rafat, who will talk a little bit about, hello. Um, Rafat, do you wanna like briefly introduce yourself and your practice a little bit? And then we can talk together about your contribution and what you did for Terra specifically. Cool, hi, thanks for having me on the site and here. Um, so if you, we, we established that if you don't hear me, well, do something because Lebanon. Okay. Um, so I'm Rafat. Most of my practice has a lot to do with um, kind of building systems of power, now I call them, where whatever can be produced can be produced collectively. Whatever is done within the cultural economy, let's say, can have some sort of impact on the perspective, social perspective, not just, let's say, um, to react or to highlight or to raise awareness, but to also create tools, right? So this project in particular that's hosted on the carriers issue is called the Khan. So the Khan is an entity that I started as part of my practice, I think 2016, a while ago. And only recently has the Khan actually become a group of people. And the, this project is only possible because it was a group of people kind of excited about it. And I'd like to name them very quickly. There's Julia, Nicole, Tala, Salim. Uh, so, uh, uh, the thing is, okay, so this project kind of like a little, I'm going to give a little bit of kind of background of where that started. When I was starting to set up the Khan, um, I was having a lot of conversations with other cultural institutions about what that could offer, right? Like what could another cultural entity offer? And most of the conversations were the projects are amazing, but we're not like it's not we are not going to be able to pay for the life of the institution. We can't pay for salaries, rent, etc. And that going that these alliances need to be kind of rethought, right? And by the way, Batul, when you were talking about the place where people that don't have anywhere else to go go to, I think that's very interesting because it's just like this site of rethinking relationships. And what I was trying to do with uh, the Khan collection is, can a cultural institution strike new alliances for it to survive, right? So if, if there's not gonna be forms of support that um, are interested in the quality of life of the artist and the cultural worker, then we make new alliances that could allow that. So the Khan collection starts an institutional art collection that is not hosted in a storage space and a venue, but rather stored um, in people's houses. So what happens is artists are invited by the Khan to uh, create personalized artworks for people that are outside of the art market, right? And uh, these people get to own the artworks, but also these artworks become kind of assets. So let's say our, uh, we started out with three uh, patrons, one other, the other sells CDs and telephones and another uh, is a van driver. And we kind of approach them because we know that they are carriers of kind of desire, information and kind of, and they're all from Tripoli by the way, where, where kind of this project is blooming. And what happened was we told them, hi, we are this cultural institution and we're very curious about what you would like as an artwork. But in return, we'd like you to have it. And it was very interesting that in the beginning of that conversation, 
everything that was raised was about ownership, payment, um, public taste, desire, and that was kind of the starting point in the fan collection. We can talk a little bit more about how it manifested for Eref later, but I just wanted to kind of place the starting point. And then again, like we can have a conversation about that later, but I don't want to be about it. You're on mute, by the way. Zen, you're muted. Yeah, I just realized. Yeah. No, it's interesting you say that. I, I kind of want to segue a little bit, just to ask a little bit more about the Khan and the collection of the Khan. Um, okay. and, and the fact that you refer to yourself, you refer to it as an institution. What kind yeah. of defines a cultural institution for you? And how, how do you find it different than other cultural okay. institutions that currently exist? So um, also to trace a little bit back, because you mentioned that the first time we wanted to work together, it was a perfume guard, right? And that's also funny because I'm, I use the word institution loosely because it, for me, it means kind of an architecture. That's my training, like I'm an architect. And, and I'm an architect and a writer that is insisting on the fact that if the mentality of the architect to build and to make a new world can be instilled in different forms of practice. And for me, cultural practice is where I kind of use that. So when the Perfume Garden started, it was the beginning of writing a novel, right? But the novel always insisted. Sorry, can I just yeah. interrupt you very quickly? Um, for anyone who doesn't know, the Perfume Garden is a serial novel uh, by Rafat. But uh, when Batuna and I first approached Rafat, we were really interested in that work. And within the context of issue two as disc before it became Carriers and before we thought about relaunching this, we were approaching him for something around that but then when we approached him and we restarted conversations it kind of moved to this so if you want to also let us know a little bit about that after yeah, yeah sorry continue okay. so so but the, the the perfume garden kind of in its inception was a landscape right it's a landscape where things that were not possible outside could have a perfume garden so let's say i'd invite um people in, on a very basic level people in palestine and lebanon that can't otherwise meet in the same in the fiction of the novel, it would allow collaboration, right? And then I decided that maybe instead of a writer doing this, like a writer writing a serial novel, could this be kind of becoming an entity? That entity always in my mind was like a municipality. Like the point of a municipality would be to bring together, manage resources, create interesting educational formats, and then grow, right? So the Khan kind of was toying and flirting with that idea for a while until very recently where I just decided that it was time to speak about it as this municipality, as this institution, right? And, and what it does is that, like with the Khan collection project, it's bringing in people to propose another, like an alternative um, mode of art labor, but also another economy, which is like renting the artworks and making money, etc. I kind of, when I speak about it, I, I like to consider it a potential like cultural for me again is loose but that's kind of the, the why I call it an institution at least not cultural institution so, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about then why you chose to do the first digital exhibition of the Han collection for Terra rather hmm. than like why that was, was that the thing that you thought would be most suited yeah I think this happened kind of in after our conversation, our first conversation after it was no longer the perfume garden, uh, it, I was very interested in carriers. Like when you mentioned it, I was like, okay, there's something there that feels like it's a question that I'm also going with, right? So with the fan collection, literally the patrons, uh, the patrons are carrying artworks of the fan and keeping them kind of uh, safely with them, but also they own them. So we're thinking about the idea of co-ownership, right? And at the same time, they don't want these to be isolated. So let's say if you have an artist scattered um, in different houses, it's interesting, but also I didn't want to create this intrusion where people would not and, and see the gym live and then whatever. So digital has never been something that I decide as, let's say, a goal. Like my questions are not necessarily about the digital, but I felt like this was, Kind of there was a luxury about being your question right and then kind of when i was asked about where i see the fan fitting and carriers in a digital form I'm like okay so i don't want to just document and i don't want to just let's say okay so project i want to try to use you as host 
for uh, the collection. Because at that time, I didn't know if I wanted to create an archive or I don't know, like uh, kind of video documentation. It was not clear for me where the projects would go. But then it was an opportunity to, to workshop. What would it mean to create something digitally, necessarily an archive? Something where people can go and experience, update, stuff like that. This is, I think, maybe if we can share screen a little bit of the, the mirror board. Yeah. It may be interesting to, to, to uh, illustrate what I'm talking about. So the way the Khan collection is now is very, very different from uh, how it started. Because initially, when I started working on the Khan collection, uh, I got a grant from Cultural Resource to do, like, it's a solo artist kind of uh, process where I personally would be working with these different patrons and creating a physical exhibition later, and then the world broke. I mean, and then it was just a delaying uh, where the answer was kind of the platform. And for me, it was that kind of, but then the possibilities of that conversation excited me about the digital. It was not a personal question of digital that kind of extended to you, if that makes sense. It does, so let me... Zoom in. Is there anywhere you want me to go in particular? Sorry. Just I think just zooming in, wandering around, because that's kind of the way, the way this works is that we have three nodes and each node is, um, is one pattern, right? And the interesting thing is that we selected them to be in the same city, but not necessarily intentionally in relation to each other. But then as we're having a lot of conversations with them, because literally every artist was going meeting with the patron and then what they want. And they would give them like prompts. The artist would go like do paint, sketch, et cetera, and then go back, ask for their opinion. And literally these people became clients. And every time that conversation extended between the artist and the patron, it also extended rhizomically between uh, the patrons themselves. So the mirror board shows how the same city about very very different things kind of start meshing into each other and that forms the, the the exhibition and it also branches out into articles information so because like this is kind of a prototype of potentially the collection eventually turning into an information platform where we're just about the conversations happening it is much much more and we after this seeing this and testing it, I think I would like to explore later how, what type of input would happen from a visitor perspective, because right now it's just a walkthrough, right? And of course, just a walkthrough is, I mean, I'm happy, but still like the confusing part is what's going to happen when, when we open it up for visitor like uh, contributions and whether, it's, you know, whether that's going to complicate it or not, I don't know. Because that's kind of like right now I have much more questions than I had before because of that kind of because of that conversation is called between the platform and the project, which for me, you know, you get my point, I'm just repeating myself. <laughs> no, yeah. no, you're kind of um, answering all of the questions I had, like as I, you know, as we were kind of going through this whole thing. Um, and I was wondering how you think um, doing something for an online platform either progress the project or didn't or made you ask different made you ask different questions mm. you kind of mentioned that but do you mm. yeah the, the thing is like when i think because the event because the venue was already something that had changed so the venue was supposed to be in ancient space once that changed literally there was a lot of potential for exploring right so the exploration of the digital actually really changed how the physical publication is going to look because intentionally I really like I'm someone that's obsessed with physical publications regardless if we have let's say a digital parallel or whatever making something and printing it and then just getting it and flipping it I get excited so every project needs to have some form of publication endpoint and for this there was something else in mind but then when when we had uh, it as a map kind of the, the relationship with the physical also was informed. And that for me is part of an interesting process that is just unraveling. It's not, I'm not saying it's better or worse, but kind of in terms of uh, feedback loop, this allowed for that. And like, it gets me excited. Yeah, no, it's, it's really exciting. Do you think it means anything for like the longevity of the project, whether 
we keep what's on now as an archive or would it still serve a certain functionality or would you just mm. look at it you know like let's say the contribution at tariff would you mm. then look back at it as just something that is that was part of the history and development of the project or do you think it, it could still i don't know serve a different purpose well because we had that like we remember probably in our first or second conversation i was very curious about what happens to the issue right after so what happened like what is the issue we replace issue two or is this going to be launched there and now it's quite interesting when you start thinking about the ledger it's very exciting in the sense that the connections that are kind of being proposed in the ledger feed can feed back into this project in different ways i mean i was just thinking about one it looks very archaic in terms of like uh, the is like hyperlinking like I mean, but... it looks it. it. It looks the parts that, <laughs> that work. But the thing is, when you're there and then you're looking at the physical one that is trying to kind of emulate uh, that is functional now, but what is to be like produced here, I don't know. It's just for me, this is the first time I look at the website because then it launched three hours ago. It's not my bad. But still, <laughs> it's just, it feels like for it to grow. But the technical interesting part is that it's an embed of another board right so whatever we're going to edit as the Khan in our exhibition board but continuously reflect uh, on tariff and that for me is also very interesting so it's a continuous conversation whether like there's a video that we didn't have time to produce for this and we we're talking about like yes this is digital because we can send it in in a week you know i mean the conversation for me you're proposing things as issues like the 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 like the volumes of issues, but I think it's there's something else there in terms of the language, because even if it's an issue, maybe, I don't know, like I'm just brainstorming out loud, there's something interesting about adopting the, the naming of, let's say, a publication we should be. There's also something about being issue, you know, there's an update, right? And that's part of the language of the digital, and at least in my project, like what we're doing here, see is the potential for updates how that would work with there or no i don't know i don't know if that even answers yeah. the question but it's just I kind of want to interject yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah on on the on the point of um why it's called an issue and also yeah. why we still think of it as a publication even though yeah. it's not printed um mm. which i think parallels a little bit how you think of the khan as an institution yeah. um yeah. It's kind of, it's, there, there is something about those two words like publication and institution that informs maybe our own decisions or our own engagement with building the space, mm -hmm. um, which might not necessarily conform uh, with like the format or the medium that it ends up manifesting. And I think there's something interesting about um, having, having this be a publication, um, having it be like, cycle based like edition based in the way that a periodical would be but also having a break in that cycle format where like things are still growing after their cycle is over and um, connections are quite lateral even though there is a linear progression in time but there are things also growing sideways with other spaces um, and i was wondering if uh the plan for like the future submissions because you now have a link on the page the page that's on carry is now for people to submit if they're an artist so i was curious about like because this goes to a google form i think now so what's what's the plan for that and if you, and is it um yeah is it going to be physical is it going to have another digital space yeah so the thing is like this and uh sorry there's a printer happening Sorry, I'm sharing the screen. I want to show the um, the submission. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so the thing is, again, this project kind of transformed from a supposedly personal project to a commission project, and now the plot, like the the idea of it being online now, kind of facilitated the fact that we can open it up for people to want to be part of it. So. Again, this is one of the things that came up because of this type of form. But after that, we started talking about it as something that the fund would support, right? Like artists could submit uh, 
an interest in a pattern and then we'd work with them. So where that would go, honestly, it's kind of, now it's a, it's a kind of a method sheet where if you're working with a pattern, you need to work with like XYZ document in this particular way, be in conversation with us while you're doing it and try to kind of connect with what is going on. Where that would go now is kind of um, not part of the game because we want to explore how to do it with someone that knows nothing about the project because like now the artists that are working are uh, Tala, Julia and Nicole which are young artists but also architects that work with me at the fan so we were kind of they were playing two roles right they knew what the project is but then they were also kind of the artist we're curious about what that means for artists to be uh, working on this project without having anything to do with it or the obligation to log it, let's say, on the mirror board, because literally it became crazy at the end because we're recording, turning them into videos, them, making the connections. So it's just further exploration rather than destination. While the first time that it started, destination was kind of a big part of the of what the project was about, right? Like the publication and the exhibition, people experiencing it. Okay. Does that um, even half answer what you said because I thought I wrapped it? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think also focusing okay. focusing on uh, exploration versus destination is also something that not to like honk the horn of digital too much, but also you can display the process I think a little bit easier in the digital space, and it's yeah, it's there's no obligation to work towards an end goal, and I think that's really interesting, but. And there's an ease to, like when we're talking about timelines, um, also something very funny, and it's, I think, Zoom land, everything feels like it's floating, the deadlines and work and process, and like everything is really negotiable in a way, where if someone is very punctual, again, I hope no one who I'd like to be punctual will listen to this, but if someone wants punctuality, I feel like it's an, it's an archaic concept, mm. where like things are stretchy, and I know that it's like this pathological thing we're all going through but there's something about dealing postponing changing adapting that the digital is allowing so it's not okay, whether it's playing process or not isn't um i'm not sure it's the core as much as the learning about how we're dealing with that platform right so the doing is now completely fine like the conversation about making a work is fine because the conversation can be it and the conversation can be logged online I don't know, there's something about yeah. time and what we're doing with things that I think is also interesting to factor in to the entire conversation of destination or not, process or not. And I think that also has been something that um, has been quite big with us around our issues. Like, yes, they're called issues, but they're, they aren't produced within a set period of time. They're not like quarterly or monthly or you know we just kind yeah. of go with it as it goes and with whatever comes through in terms of contributions they keep being added so for example if we were to launch issue three but then there's something that really fits within carriers that somebody wants to contribute or that we come across it could go into that you know so that's also the idea that we're not just moving linear linearly yeah mm -hmm. um I think that's it for us. I kind of just want to maybe I think the it would be interesting for the attendees to hear a little bit about the how you're also changing the economic model a little bit, yeah. how that works. Totally related okay. to the Han as a project, just because I think it's super interesting. Okay, so in respect to the collection, right? The collection, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what's usually I mean one of the one of the things that we wanted to kind of um, talk about is the fact that in, in the art world, we see, and it's very normal to talk about the fictional creation of money, right? So let's say you'd have work and the piece of work can be shown in an auction and the materiality of the work does not necessarily represent the value, the monetary value of the work. And the exchange, and it's as if you get a product, you put it on there, you're able to inflate the value and then circulate it and then continuously inflate and deflate the value and circulate it. Well, this is happening in a very affluent kind of um, sector, group of people. It has, it's a bubble kind of economy. While on the, on the other hand, let's say the Khan as a municipality is curious, 
is that why that when we're talking about uh, other economies, let's say just random communities that a municipality would be responsible for, money uh, is something that is very hard. We see very next to it, money is just being fictionally created. So what is happening in this process, we are inviting artists that are emerging artists, young artists, to have the opportunity of being part of this very public platform, being paid uh, a commission for their work, and then uh, producing work for patrons that are completely outside of the market. What happens is that uh, these artworks become logged kind of and co-owned by the Khan. What the Khan does is that it starts kind of working like a real estate agent and trying to circulate these works renting it to exhibitions, writing about it, increasing its value, and the value, this land that is being rented, goes to the, the, the patrons that own them. So the fictional creation of money now goes sideways, and it goes to a different, uh, completely different group of people outside of the art market. So while they're generating, let's say, knowledge, talking about public taste, uh, having intimate conversations between artists outside of the gallery, it is actually at the core a very economic thing with um, the world, which is the actual world. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to hate on either, but what I'm trying to say is that there is a big issue for me, at least in resource management on, let's say, a, a master, master, like a macro image, where it's actually quite really easy to make a lot of money. And when main issues seem to be money, and now I'm speaking as someone that is in Lebanon, it's like I've been, we're having the crash of crashes. It may be interesting to not think about a like financial being thrown in and then the systems that work, or just like bubbling up. It might be interesting to just open the whole thing up. And that's what the fan collection tries to do. And it does it as kind of an independent small entity wants to be this municipality, to be this institution, and it performs it because the background is right, cultural methodologies, performance. It's it's toying with different languages in order to yield something very simple, is a more just economic kind of impact of a research project. And this is where kind of I go back to this obsession with writing and architecture and making something real and moving forward with that. And thanks for asking me much. Like I, I don't speak to this. So I like this. So yeah. No, I think it's super, super interesting and super relevant, especially for anyone who works within the art field. You know, like I work at an art fair. The the idea of patronage and like new models that are coming out is, is very interesting for for all of these conversations that are having right now. So it's really exciting. Cool. Thanks. Um, but would do you have any anything to add? Any questions? No, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I'd be curious to hear what the attendees think, or if anyone has any questions, or if Mace, if you want to ask us anything. Yeah, I kind of want to jump onto that last point that Rafat and Zain were discussing, um, and ask Rafat if you can talk to us about the Maghribiya sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yeah pull, pull that. so this is on the website. Um, yeah. yeah, so this started as an inside joke, like most of our work, um, where we wanted to kind of make a diagram, but without it being this like uh, lingo kind of crazy, whatever. And we decided, so Tripoli is very well known for putting Maghrabi in a sandwich. And every time you say like, have you tried a Maghrabi sandwich? Like Maghrabi in a sandwich, carb carb. So yes, carb carb is the best hangover food. Uh, so what happens is that we kind of try, we were thinking about how to illustrate what the Khan collection wants to do something that already exists. So Maghrabi is used here as kind of, it's the same dish there but one is very domestic it's private it's in one family you cannot move around with it etc and what the Khan collection or the piece of bread does is that it wraps it up and then it becomes street food and it becomes, becomes sharing around mobile so this is of course we're not taking ourselves seriously with like an academic footnoting of this but the but the 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 core of it is that these conversations are jokes that we have with our with right so 
why are you doing this? To pay you for this, like stuff like that. And then we, instead of bringing up uh, art economy and talking about something that is irrelevant, potentially sitting, having a coffee, the share, we just make a joke about the Maghrebi. And if it makes an offense, great. If it doesn't, it's a great joke. And this is kind of uh, what this diagram is doing. The diagram. Also, thanks for your question. See, I suck at the project, but like, we're <laughs> no, this is good because I, I mean, it's fantastic because it actually kind of brings me to one of my other questions, which is maybe more broadly uh, to all of you, um, which is about kind of how, you know, I'm basically I'm thinking about process and I'm thinking about process um, on sort of these projects that are communal efforts. Um, and there is a couple of, there's two parts to this question, which actually first I, would, I wanted to ask about the process of coming up with your themes. Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking of disc and uh, carriers. They're really curious themes and I wanted to hear more about that and then kind of segueing from that onto um, just the process of starting the collaborations or sort of the communal kind of conversations. And I, I imagine it's a bit different for Khan and for Tari. So it's maybe a very long question, but I'd love to hear from you guys. For Tarif, um, I would say most of the time, Batul stumbles upon a word, but it usually <laughs> comes out of uh, conversations that we're already having. So it could be completely random conversations that are not tied to one another, but they end up kind of coming under this um, one word that she'll usually come across or think up. Um, and so I think it also kind of becomes, so let's say we, you know, chose carriers or disc or whatever. And the minute we kind of agree on, on a word, um, we just start coming across uh, things that contributors or works or texts that we find relevant. So it's kind of like this idea of, you know how, I would not know this, but apparently if you're pregnant, all you see are pregnant women, you start swatting out pregnant women in the street. So it's kind of the same thing here. Yeah, also just to add one more thing, it's always in relation to the Arabic word as well. So like specifically with disc, um, the word qurs was really like in, like, it was it was the pregnant lady. Like it, it was something that came up everywhere, um, which was also how tariff, tariff's name came about. Like it was one of those words that ended up becoming a node for associating to different situations. And it's through, I mean, I think this is also the reason that we don't have deadlines for our issues because it takes a while for all these connections to really formulate and make sense with each other. So for our next issue, which will be called avatars, um, that is like, that is now being um, slowly built up through like people that we know that are working on adjacent things and it makes sense of itself like we don't write the editorial text until the very end like it's been in the in prog in progress for the whole time that we were doing the residency because it only takes its form after we've like made all the connections asked all the people and the whole thing kind of comes together crystallizes in a way um yeah, yeah. so the process okay. isn't like we outline something and then try to get things to fit into it. Rather, it's kind of this osmosis. Of, of What's the Arabic for avatar? We haven't gone there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, now I want to ask what the how the Arabic for carriers. Yeah, talk more about. So that. the Arabic for carriers was the Sa'ila. and the thing is, it's not a direct translation from the word carriers, mm. which would have a root in like. Hamala or something. Um, Sorry, can you say that again? Was that al Rasila? Siyah Sa'ila. Siyah Sa'ila. Which is more a translation of the word mediums, I guess. Um, yeah. it's, so it's not always a direct, like one to one translation. We'll, fi we'll figure out what, what avatars would be. Because I felt it was interesting, like carrier Siyah Sa'ila. Okay, so now I'm left to actually make some. I'm, I'm in the and now I want to know like see outside that works. So, uh, we work with, you know, with, but, but do you want to say who we work yeah with? so we worked with um one of my friends and 
who's also a sound researcher and writer um, who goes by Bintambara. She's linked in the website. Um, and she wrote the Arabic version of the editorial. And in the writing of that, um, we specifically did not want to translate from English. And the English at the time was just like a list of bullet, bullet lists. Um, and it was a process of like understanding what we mean by carriers and then talking to her over like several conversations about how that would be communicated using Arabic words that are not just going, you know, like just translating yeah. what carriers mean. Um, so yeah, and the editorial is one of those cases where like, it's technically someone else's contribution, but it's also like part of Tariff as well. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting because that actually gets to that other part, which is, um, I was curious basically is if there was a clean line or not. I mean, maybe I was, it was also a bit of a bait question for me, which is where, where do the other voices come in? Um, and that's, I mean, that's actually a quite a clear answer that your editorial is not a translation, but rather a sort of, again, a collaboration in another language. Um, I, I don't know if I should pause. I have a couple other questions, but maybe I'll, I'll see if anyone else wants to ask anything. Um, I mean, feel free to interrupt me uh, with comments or Q&A. Um, but I also wanted to, uh, Rafat, you mentioned, um, kind of the interesting kind of moments of friction. Well, I don't know if, it, if they're friction in the way that you described them, but between the physical and the digital. And uh, you guys talked about that a little bit, but I actually kind of want to hear a little bit more for Tarif uh, beyond just, you know, the uh, structural relation to a physical publication. And I'm wondering if more broadly, there were moments where, um, uh, you know, maybe with con contributors or, you know, I mean, you're both in different parts of the world and um, yeah, and I know that you guys think a lot about, you know, you've mentioned you think about the digital space, but I'm just wondering because we don't experience the digital without the physical, right? I mean, um, and I'm just wondering where maybe were there moments in the process that you found, um, you know, these kind of uh, little sparks between these two realms um, or sort of points of touch. I don't know if that's too over, all over the place to be answered, but. No, it's a good question. I just don't know if there's a solid answer to that. Um, when Rafat mentioned that, you know, he, he loves physical publishing and feels like, you know, he wants it and there's a need for it. I think Batur and I are the same. Um, also, I think initially, 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 we were thinking of doing um, something that was like a physical publication. But I think that idea has been parked. Yeah, I mean, because I also, you know, I'm looking at the page that Rafa put together and some things, you know, I mean, I can see obviously that things in the same way that your editorial isn't a one-to-one -on -one translation, that things can exist in the physical in a way that is not a one-to-one -one translation. Um, uh, but I guess, I don't know. I mean, this is a question because it's something that I ask myself often in my practice as well as at work and with, you know, sort of putting, setting up this residency. Um, but I wonder a lot about, um, you know, we say that we don't want to replicate the physical and the digital and that the digital is, you know, gives us certain kind of freedoms and also different constraints than the digital and so, um, you know, it's it's a, a different kind of architectural space really to work within. Um, but at the same time, it's not actually that, it's not dissociated from the physical, right? So it's just something that I think about a lot and I just wanted to throw out in there, which is, um, you know, an online, an online exhibition or online video installation or an online kind of uh, multimedia essay. Um, still has to have some relationship with the, you know, we see it on the screen, essentially. And I don't know, it's no longer a question at this point. I think, extreme thought, but. Well, I think it kind of has to do with what you choose to show and how you choose to show it, right? So say for example, I don't know, I had a video 
that was being in that we're putting on on the website i think within a physical space you you'd the setup for the video would make a huge difference in how you experience it so that could be it or if it's a really large project you can pick and choose you can choose text to put online whereas something that's heavily text-based within a physical space you wouldn't necessarily put on there so i think it kind of comes down to to that and then mm -hmm. um I mean, it would be really nice to see that some of, if some of these contributions then take a physical form elsewhere on a platform that is phys that is in person and physically kind of living. Yeah. So rather than us look at something that you know, looking at what what we can do physically or in in, in real life, have there be connections where it, the project grows to somewhere mm. else that caters for this kind of thing. Because it really becomes a, uh, like, you know, but you said crystallization, but it becomes a different, you know, growth from the project. It doesn't, it's not a replica, or it's not like uh, just a different edition, but actually a whole other kind of manifestation of it. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, when everything went digital, all these places started doing um, virtual tours of their exhibitions. First one was cool, kind of, but then is that how you want to interact with the art or is there a better way should what you're showing online be different to you just filming um, an exhibition that's in real space yeah yeah um that's that's i mean i think the question is even further which is even if it's a, it's different from what you're showing in space how much do you acknowledge the effect of the space onto the digital um because it's, I feel like it's impossible to completely disengage from just the physical, you know, like if we're talking about kind of uh, institutionally, I think the thing that started happening soon after everyone realized that virtual, you know, uh, straightforward tours are not the thing is like kits or, you know, there's like this material kind of part of uh, engaging with things online. So that's kind of when I'm, when I'm thinking of, um, uh, you know, looking at a digital uh, anything, um, I'm still maybe I'm going I'm going super meta, but like I still experience it through my body, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those are the questions that I'm asking, like in, in, in not just to you, but actually just in general. Um, how do we also still work with the body when we're creating things that live on our screens? So actually, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think something that happens in the physical space that doesn't, that, or not doesn't happen, but happens differently in on digital space is fatigue. And mm. when you're physically walking through an exhibition or sitting through a video, I'm a big fan of video work, but I honestly would be lying if I said that I sat through and watched a complete video piece in a, in a physical show. And I think that is something that I could, that I would do um, on like a live online screening or something that's, you know, on the, the, the formats of the screen um, already relates to how I spend my time in a, in a way where I can, you know, sit with content for a little bit longer. And I think, this translation between physical to digital actually has a lot more to do with time than it has to do with space. Mm. So you, like, I, don't, I don't have the answers, I don't know how to bridge that, but I think that's kind of the start of the thread of you know, tailor, tailoring online spaces um, temporally as opposed to physically. Yeah. I think uh, space, um, does the opposite for me. Like the, the fatigue kind of helps me stay and watch the video because like now I'm thinking the the I just don't last in in the webinar now that we're in one I need to be here and think. But I mean I I haven't watched as much uh, webinars and talks that I thought I was gonna the amount of topics that I'm like amazing. Yes, perfect. I want but I just can't because, like, speaking of the physicality of the domestic screen, when everything is happening on it, I just mm -hmm. don't want. To, I mean, the like work, teaching, friends, um, films, whatever. And it feels 
but almostifying screens is something that still physical like now I would watch much more Netflix on my phone rather than on my laptop because I want to be as far away from my laptop as possible. Or if I want to have a conversation and I'd rather do it on Instagram with a filter just because it's a different physicality of that format. And I think what I feel it has been taken away from me is that fatigue you're talking about. And it's just going and looking at a screen decided to have this say someone walking from and I would need to sit down and watch. I don't know, like there's something mm. about that that enabled uh, my my version of art, let's say, or now fleets with the digital. So I feel question a lot even when producing, like from the from the perspective of the producer, I don't consume much of that. So but I would let's say consume a lot of public work, which I also this transference to, to the digital for the maker, not only for the platform mm. uh, maker, is, is a question of, like consume that. Like at least for me, if it weren't a board where I'm in classes, etc., it would be hard for me to to just, you know, like even text when I publish text about professional performance. <laughs> like if this was not this crazy like pop-up whatever it's hard for me to just sit down and read the text i would need to print it out and read it just because I it on the screen. so the, the question of the body and the device okay by the way i can first i don't know what i'm still here did i freeze no no, no you you're cutting off a little bit end. but yeah but you keep you cut out at the end um, something about the body yeah, I'm just thinking that the body, not just as the physicality of the body, but the physicality of the device, like mm -hmm. what we're experiencing with, is mm -hmm. important somehow because yeah. you would see, right? And now it feels super native and you do as part of an extension of your body. So when you're producing an artwork, like at least for the hand collection, we weren't using the artwork for the digital, but the structure for the digital then it would kind of be, okay, so I need to take that, use that to reach something. That's kind of a question. I don't know, at least from my end, which I'm not a consumer of a lot of now non-mandatory online content. You know what I mean? Yeah. Can and we I don't know the audience? answer either. Huh? I'm saying, can we bring in the audience? Hi, Mona. Yeah. Yes. Because Mona's <laughs> on there and... Muna does video work, so I, I don't know if that is interesting for her. Yeah, oh, I'm Muna just, I, sorry, Muna, to put you on the spot, but I thought it's I'd only in, if you're comfortable, if you yeah. want to. Um, and if anyone else wants to say anything, you can raise your hands. I can give you like permission to speak. Um, Hi. 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 Um, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I was actually sending a text to someone, so could you? Do you mind repeating? <laughs> no, Just bringing I... in the the audience is basically, um, and since it's someone that's part of the residency, we we don't need to put you on the spot. We just, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a few of us. So. No, I'm happy to get involved, but if, could you just repeat? Yeah, no, I was wondering because, like, you as an artist who, I guess, a digital artist who creates works, how does that inform your practice or your decisions in any way? And how, like, yeah. do you think of how your audience experiences your work? Um, yeah, we're yeah, thinking of the physical. I think yeah. about that a lot. Um, and more of the physical than of uh, the digital. I think just because the digital is so saturated with videos and the attention span is about like three seconds. And the physical, the attention span is probably a little bit more, but it's not that much more either. But um, I in the past I've thought of um, chairs or benches as a way of um, bringing people to spend more time with the work. So um, yeah, that's yeah. You, you, you there are tricks that you could do when it's physical, and I feel like we're still experimenting with tricks in the digital to like make someone comfortable um 
um, and I want think, to spend time. I think it's also like acceptance that some people um, like, so, like I, I think I've reached a point where I realized like the work is, is there for you if you want it to be there, but if you don't, it's not there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Um, well, I think, Mace, you shared the links in the chat. So she shared the Rafat's contribution page, our website. Just bear in mind that we launched, we did launch like a couple hours ago today. Things are still coming, changing, growing. Um, but Follow yeah. Instagram <laughs> for updates. Yeah, let's find your Instagram and link it. Yeah. And, you know, um, uh, I think even though you launched only a couple of hours ago, there's quite there's plenty, and it's it looks fantastic, and I, um, and it's a it's a growing kind of resource. So, um, I wouldn't discourage anyone from visiting it already. Um, but yeah, I think anyway we're we're we've made good time. Um, I do want to say thank you again to everyone that is that has attended. Thank you, Muna, uh, for jumping <laughs> onto the conversation. <laughs> I'm sorry to start to Leo. <laughs> no, um, and always good to hear your voice, Muna. And uh, thank you so much, Rafat, for joining us and for contributing. And of course, the tool Zain for this fantastic project. Um, we will definitely be continuing this conversation with you guys. And um, yeah, that's it. And have a good Amazing. evening. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye.